Cool. How are you? Doing well. How are you? All righty. I guess tell, tell me a little bit about yourself and a little bit about Winston and what's going on and what your questions are. Um, so my name's Brittany. <coughs> I, um, Winston is my dog. He's a French bulldog. Um, he's a little older than three and a half. Um, we're in Florida, actually only a couple hours away, I think, from um, your practice. So um, in January, he was um, d diagnosed with IVDD. Um, it happened very suddenly. We returned from vacation and he was kind of lethargic for a couple of days, which is normal when we get back from vacation and he's staying with family and other dogs. But randomly, he just ha ha started having these episodes um, that I sent the videos of. So they did some x-rays and they saw that he also has the, um, the hemovertebrae, um, but no MRI was done. We went to the neurologist, so when they said based on his signs, it was most likely that um, we did crate rest and management because after probably a few days of being on um, gabapentin, a muscle relaxer, anti-inflammatory, um, he was way, way, way better. No, I mean, he, of course, occasionally had some pain, but no severe episodes. And by the time we saw the neurologist, they said his, his exam presented very normally. Um, no obvious neurological deficits. So it was obviously working for him. And then after crate rest, I would say about a month after he was kind of released to start activity again, we had a very small flare up. Nothing, like I would say probably on a scale of one to 10, it was like a two compared to what he was presenting as originally. Uh, very mild, just like one spasm in the neck every now and then. Um, it would maybe happen once every five minutes and after 20 minutes it would be gone. So we started again on gabapentin, um, muscle relaxers and tried crate rest again. Um, they were trying to do it for only four weeks is what the neurologist recommended since it was so mild, but he was still, every time I would try to wean him off the gabapentin at that point, he would kind of come out whenever I take him out of his crate, he would look a little bit arched, a little bit painful, but nothing severe. By the time we would go out for our morning potty break, he would come in walking perfectly fine and not look painful. Um, but we, we did another like full eight, eight weeks, basically this week is probably 12 week 12 since that first flare up. Um, and he's doing fine. He's doing great now. My question is, I guess more, she said that maybe she being his neurologist, maybe he just needs to be on gabapentin permanently, um, to not have these flare ups. I guess my concern is, is that typical to recommend that for, permanent. He's so young that is he going to build up a resistance to it? Um, like my worry is when he's, let's say 10, you know, or nine, and he maybe has a more severe episode. Um, is the gabapentin not going to work as effectively for him? And then obviously at that age, surgery is more of a risk. So it's just debating on when to consider like actually getting an MRI or possibly moving towards a surgical route if every time I take him off the gabapentin, he seems to flare up. Yeah, so I mean, you're, you're describing a relatively common scenario and I, I saw the videos of him, he's, he's super handsome. Um, Thank you. And just uh, I, the, the, the French bulldog face, you can tell when they're not feeling well, just that it's so expressive that uh, Right. I, I feel for him just seeing these videos. The classic symptoms of neck pain are just like what you're describing. Um, you know, not being as active, holding the head low, the ears being pulled back, the spasms in the neck. Sometimes instead of, you know, looking around like this, they'll kind of, you know, move their whole body or what we call, you know, wet weather vein, kind of move like a, like a weather vein. Um, many times dogs will cry out spontaneously and it sounds like, you know, that, that's kind of how we started out. Yes. So it's very reasonable first time neck pain to do just what your vet did where they, they put them on medications and um, most dogs on medications, if it's just neck pain, meaning they're not walking wobbly or dragging their legs, you know, there's a good 65, 70% chance, assuming it's a slipped disc, that those dogs can get better from it. So, you know, wholeheart wholeheartedly agree with the approach of, you know, first time, let's try medications. You know, by the time you got to the neurologist, things were, were much improved. Certainly, you know, my approach is if, if a dog's getting better, let, let me get out of the way and let it continue to get better. Mm -hmm. So 
what, what I usually coach owners on is if I say there's a 65 to 70 percent chance that it's going to get better, that means there's a 30 to 35 percent chance it doesn't get better. And or symptoms may come back, which is, is what's happened with Winston. Right. Um, you know, it certainly wasn't as bad that time. You, you, you had the medications with you. So it's very, very reasonable to try medications again. Um, and it wasn't as, as severe that time. At this point, um, you know, the fact that he's doing relatively well, it, it's hard to make the recommendation of, well, now we should move to an MRI. You know, you've done 12 weeks of rest and, you know, sure, he's not 100% and we're always kind of worried about it, but he's much better than he was after the flare up and he's much, much better than when it all started. Mm -hmm. But all of this with me not being able to see him personally and um, you know examine him myself, my general approach would be if symptoms aren't getting better or if they're getting worse. Um, so if we had started medications and he wasn't getting better at all, or if we had started medications and he was getting worse, or if it's recurrent. So um, you know, kind of at that first flare up, at that point, I, I think you would have had the option of continuing rest and medications versus doing tests. Where we're at right now, I, you know, I, I think it makes sense to continue with rest and medications, but I would, I would have in the, in the back of my mind, you know, a, a third strike and you're out type thing. Right. You know, if, if this happens again, to, to your point of, you know, well, I don't want him to be on medications, you know, for, for the next 10 years, he's only three and a half. My approach with doing tests, you know, I don't like to do tests willy nilly, but the, the tests let us know what we're dealing with. Yes, a slipped disc is the most likely cause in a three and a half year old French Bulldog, but there are other things that can cause the exact same symptoms of neck pain that get better with medications. Um, Frenchies will also get things like meningitis that can cause neck pain. They can get things like malformations. You said he has a hemivertebra um, in, in his, I assume sort of mid back as opposed to his neck. Um, yes, and something um, at the lower back, I think by his, kind of by his tail, they said um, it, that it was creating almost like a bridge, something like that. <laughs> Ondulosis or something like that. Yes, so, I, so I think that's what the other neurologist said. There are other things other than a slip disc that can cause the symptoms of neck pain, meningitis, infection, which we probably would have seen on x-rays, tumors, he's a little on the young side for that, but the, the, the point is, rationale for doing tests would be one, find out what the underlying cause is. Two, sometimes dogs will have a really large slipped disc on the MRI compared to somewhat relatively mild symptoms. And I use that MRI to say, well, gosh, this is such a big disc bulge that it's probably not going to get better with rest and medication. So I'm able to predict they're that 30% as opposed to that 70%. And if it's a slipped disc, the likelihood of fixing it with surgery is, you know, 95 plus percent, um, depending on who you talk to. But, um, you know, for the, for the average French bulldog, the likelihood of fixing it is, is quite good. Obviously, we, we want to avoid surgery if we can. And that's why, you know, the recommendation has been made of, hey, let's try rest of medications first. Let's try rest and medications again. Again, you've got a neurologist on your team, so I don't want to kind of muddy the waters. But generally speaking, the times where I would recommend tests would be if symptoms aren't getting better, if they're recurrent, which is kind of the, the scenario that Winston's presenting with us with, or if they're just not our classic French, excuse me, classic slip disc breed. French Bulldogs are kind of our number one or number two breed nowadays with a slip disc. So he does fit in the category of it's likely a slipped disc. But if you were like a, a boxer or a golden retriever or something like that with neck pain, that to me would be another reason to consider tests a little bit sooner. So I, I think where you're at right now, if you've done rest and medications the second time, he's overall doing well. You've kind of finished the 12 weeks I would continue to limit his activity. I wouldn't just cut him loose. And it looks like in the one video, you've, you've got another Frenchie. I, I know it's probably tough to keep them quiet when they're excited, um, mm -hmm. but trying to limit activity as much as you can, trying to avoid the high impact activity, jumping on and 
um, on and off of furniture, tearing up and down stairs, you know, playing shake the toy, playing tug of war, uh, mm -hmm. things like that. Um, if he doesn't have a harness, he should certainly have a harness as opposed to a, a neck lead. With the information that, that I have and what we're, we're talking about, my kind of rule of thumb would be, if this happens again, um, I would be leaning towards towards tests. Yeah, and he, um, we have been limiting the activity. Luckily, the other dogs are relatively old, um, a lot older than him, so lower energy. And he has a ramp and all of that stuff. So I really think the first flare up, it was right when we started working from home permanently during the situation. So he was just out and about a lot more and we were in the the time span of trying to teach him to use the ramp. So there were, of course, more mishaps. Right. Um, so he is doing really great now. And we, I still make sure to keep him in his like rusted crate area about a couple hours, four hours a day while we're working anyways. The only thing that really worries me about his behavior is, and I'm wondering if this is a, a pain, like a, a, a pain sign that you've seen in other um, cases with possible neck discs. Um, is when he, when I first go to let him out in the morning or just random times throughout the day when he gets a little bit excited or anxious and he is a, a more excitable and anxious dog, um, particularly after his injury, um, is teeth chattering. Um, and when he chatters his teeth, his cheeks and like his head muscles kind of like convulse a bit. Um, kind of like, I guess if we were cold, you know, um, it go no other signs of pain along with that. His ears aren't bad, he's not arched. It's strictly just that. Um, and it goes away very quickly. Um, and it only seems to be when he's overall, I can just tell that he's like amped up. Right. Is that something I should be concerned about? Um, and is it just his energy? Is that normal for him? Or is that something that I, I should worry that it's his small way of showing that he's maybe still painful? It's not a classic um, symptom of, of pain. So I think in the absence of the other symptoms of pain, holding the head down, being less active, et cetera, I wouldn't worry a lot about it. Um, I would okay. keep an eye on it, but my, my gut feel is that it does not mean that he's still painful. I would be looking okay. for the more classic symptoms of neck pain, holding the head low, ears back, arched back, spasms in the neck. Okay, great, that makes me feel better. He's always done it a little bit, even before this, like when we were, were to get home from work, but I definitely noticed an, an increase in it since this. But um, like I said, his anxiety level and energy level has definitely been more difficult to manage with the crate rest and all that. Very helpful. I just want to say thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak with you. Um, I really enjoy the videos that you guys post educationally. Um, it's very overwhelming to get this diagnosis. So it really does help a lot with um, the stress of that and just feeling that everything's going to still be okay and that he can lead, you know, a healthy life. So I, I appreciate you saying that. I mean, um, we, we do this because we, we, we love dogs and we especially love French bulldogs and, you know, we're all pet owners. So we, we know how tough it is to see when your your dog's not not well, so we get it. But I appreciate you saying that, and all. Um, this is this is the person behind all of the all of the videos. Hi, That's Emily. Great work. It's I look forward to your post. So. All right. Nice meeting you. Uh, nice meeting you. Be you safe. too. Thanks. Bye bye. Hi, Rebecca. Hello, Donna. Oh, Doctor Wong. How are you? Good at yourself. All right. Yeah, this is Apollo. 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 Hey, bud. He's 12 year old American Staffordshire mix breed. All right. T tell me uh, about him. So he's, uh, I've had him since he was eight weeks old. He was found in a dumpster. Um, he had distemper the first three months of his life. He survived that. Got pneumonia, got Demodex, has had broken toes, broken teeth. Um, basically, you name it, this dog's had it. He has survived a lot. Um, now, the issue that he's having um, from assuming going to the vet and everything um, and reading online um, that he has signs of vestibular disease. Okay. Assuming, I don't know. I haven't gone to you, so I couldn't say that. Um, what but what symptoms is he showing? Um, the eyes and the, the, his movement, his, uh, when he gets up afterwards, he's unable to walk. Um, he did have an episode at the vet that he shook and he pancaked completely out. Uh, laid flat out in front of the vet that she was like, whoa, 
Um, and that's when she also had suggested I go to you um, to see, you know, to see if there was something underlining there for him. Um, and he had the most recent episode in December um, that he was, no, actually, I'm sorry, he had the most recent episode in April. Um, prior to that, he had one in December in the middle of the night. He just, um, I heard him trying to get up. I get up myself and there's urine on the floor. Um, and so I guess, I assume he peed and he was trying to get up. He was unstable. His eyes were doing the darting back and forth, back and forth. Um, I think I sent a video to your staff um, of that. Um, and then uh, he had another one in April um, and it took him about 45 minutes to an hour to snap out of it. Um, he was able to, he would hear me, he would respond to me, um, but that's it. Um, and then it would just went away. And then two days later, I took him in for his annual to get everything checked out. Everything seemed normal. Um, and then now we're here. So how is he right now? Is he, is, is he normal right now? Is he doing the, the abnormal eye movements or? No, he hasn't done that since that last time. It, it's only happened about four times in total. Um, and, and you said but, the first one was in, in December 2019? No, no, the first one was in probably February 2019. Oh, wow. So February yeah. 19, December 19, April April. 20, April 20. Yeah, no, February, eight, June, April, December, and April, four times. February, June, December. okay. Are, are the episodes worse every time, or are they kind of the, the same? They're identical. Um, I couldn't tell you that they've seemed worse. He gets out of it, and he, he wants to eat. Like, I try to get him, because I, I, I don't know what, I didn't know what was going on until I read into it. So I kind of try to get him to focus, and he'll focus. He'll, he'll look at me, and, and um, but when I try to even videotape or do anything to him, he's, he's very well aware of things. He's, he's been involved in the veterinary world a lot. So he's, he's like, oh, you're recording me? So he'll try to adjust himself so I can't see anything happening. I think all dogs do that. Once you get the camera out, they, they won't do yeah, what you're trying yeah, to record. Yeah, he avoids eye contact and everything. Okay, and in between the episodes, is he 100% normal or is he kind of always a little goofy or? No, I mean, other than just because he has hip dysplasia and he's a large breed dog, I mean, and we have tile floor, he struggles a little to get up, but could I say that it's horrible? No. Um, do I see a little bit of the walking wobbly sometimes? Definitely. Um, okay. There are times that I think he kind of spaces out that he'll he'll be sleeping, and all of a sudden he'll just and he'll sit there like okay, kind of trying to I I'm seeing that he's trying to trying to like just center himself, and then he'll get up and he'll actually go to one specific uh, area of the house and lay there and because he has the wall there and I think it makes him feel like okay I'm not moving anymore. Well, so I, I saw the videos and and. He, he has this obvious uh, nystagmus or jerking movements of the eyes. Um, in, in the video that I saw, he's, he's sitting in one spot, so I can't really see how he moves around, but that's very suggestive of a balance problem. So a balance problem, I'll, I'll kind of use synonymously with a vestibular problem. Um, okay. The, the vestibular system is the part of the nervous system responsible for maintaining balance. And the classic symptoms we see when a dog has a balance problem, many times they'll have their head cocked to one side, their eyes will kind of jerk in side to side. Sometimes it will be up and down. Sometimes it'll kind of rotate. Sometimes one of the eyes stays lower than the other. So one looks forward and one goes down. That's what we call strabismus. Many times they'll walk drunk. They'll kind of list or, or fall to one side. If it's real severe, sometimes they can't get up at all and they'll just kind of roll in one direction, kind of like a like an alligator roll. The video that you sent shows kind of the that rapid eye movement side to side, um, and you're describing things like just being off balance, just uh, being incoordinated. Um, did did you see anything like a head tilt where his head was cocked to one side? No, he really he's always done that on his own naturally. So to say that he does it now more, no. But I've always noticed his right side like recently like that his right side's a little bit lower but to say dramatically no because he's always had a head tilt there are two parts of the balance system um we think of it as things outside of the brain what we call the peripheral vestibular system that's things like the inner ear and then we have what's called the central vestibular system which is the back part of the brain and a an examination in person would help us better look for abnormalities that might make us more worried about an ear problem versus a brain problem or vice versa. So what you're describing and what I saw in the video, I wouldn't be able to say one is more likely than 
than the other from, from the video. What are the things that can affect the, the inner ear, so the peripheral vestibular system? Um, things like ear infections, things like tumors of the ear. Um, one of the most common things is what we call old dog vestibular syndrome. Other things, low thyroid, et cetera, can cause peripheral vestibular disease. The things that we see inside of the brain that can cause balance problems are in general more worrisome. Things like brain tumors, things like strokes, things like inflammation of the brain, uh, certain degenerative causes, uh, certain medications um, we can see cause balance problems. On the one hand, the fact that it's been going on or that it's, it's been episodic since over mm -hmm. a year ago and it hasn't gotten worse makes me cautiously optimistic that it's not something more worrisome like a brain tumor or meningitis or encephalitis, just those things we would expect to get worse over that period of time. Obviously, we can't rule that out just by the description, but the time course and the fact that it hasn't gotten worse makes it a little less likely for us. The fact that it's been happening, you know, we've had four episodes, um, even though they're not getting necessarily worse, they're not going away, this would be something worth looking into further to find out, is it something that, that we can help? The way that we approach a dog with balance problems is, you know, first getting a nice history and uh, just talking about when it started, is it getting worse, et cetera. The, the second step is an evaluation. So being able to examine a dog in person just gives us a whole lot more information and lets us sort of take our conversation from being very broad to being much more specific. From there, tests are often necessary in order to, to put our finger on what the exact cause is. Is it something you know good like an ear infection or something more worrisome like a brain tumor? Um, the tests we start off with in general are less expensive and less invasive. Things like blood tests. So um, what's called a complete blood counter, a CBC, looks at things like red blood cells, white blood cells, can give us markers of you know, inflammation and infection and things like that. By it itself, doesn't necessarily give us an answer, but is a good screen. Uh, same thing with a chemistry panel. That's a blood test that looks at things like the liver and the kidneys, et cetera. One of the other blood tests that I would often do for a dog with a balance problem would be a thyroid test. It by itself wouldn't give me a cause and effect just because balance problems are so common and thyroid disease is so common, especially in a 12 year old large breed dog that by itself, low thyroid, I wouldn't say, gosh, I know the answer but it's still part of a piece of the puzzle. Low thyroid by itself sometimes can be associated with balance problems, but it can also lead to things like strokes, which can cause balance problems. So very important for us to, to do that as part of our first tier of tests. X-rays of the heart and lungs, plus or minus of the belly, are a good first line set of tests. Um, just it screens for things like cancer, screens for things like heart and lung disease that could lead to balance problems. And then one of the other tests that we do as a, a first line test would be um, a blood pressure. Sometimes dogs will have really high blood pressure and that can lead to things like strokes, which can lead to balance problems. So that's kind of the, the first tier of tests, blood work, x-rays, blood pressure, thyroid testing, et cetera. Assuming that doesn't give us an answer, the next set of tests would be something like an MRI. Um, this is a time where a CAT scan is not a great test for looking at uh, neurological disease. CAT scans can show things like severe ear disease or tumors of the bones of the ear, but they don't give us a good look at the brain. So things like strokes, some tumors, meningitis, infection, et cetera, can all be missed by a CAT scan. So this is one of the places that we really strongly recommend an MRI. An MRI can show us those things, things like tumors, meningitis, encephalitis, ear infections, 
uh, strokes, et cetera. Occasionally a spinal tap is performed. We do that after the MRI. If the MRI gives us the answer, many times we don't have to do a spinal tap or if the MRI says the spinal tap is too risky, we don't do it. But that's one of the tests that, that we would proceed with. So based on Apollo, you know, the fact that it's happened four times, it's sure it's episodic, sure he's doing well right now, but the fact that it's happened four times over the last 15, 16 months is a reason to consider tests just to find out, is there something we can be doing to make sure that that fifth one doesn't happen or make it as unlikely as possible uh, to, to happen again? Or he if had, I'm sorry, he had blood work a week ago. Okay. I sent it in to you guys. He does have high liver enzymes right now, um, but everything else came back normal. Okay. Um, he had a pancreatitis episode about two weeks prior um, that discovered an underlying UTI. Um, okay. He's still fighting that now at this moment. Um, but he had blood work and according to the vet, he did, it did come back normal. Now in regards to the x-rays, he also had those because he had an annual done the 16th Perfect. of um, and he had that and he had, it, she did show me as well that the heart um, did look larger. Because again, since I've had his x-rays done prior with the same vet, they had a comparison and she said she did notice that his heart did get larger as well. Um, we haven't sent it up to the cardio, um, to the, the radiograph specialist um, so that they can tell us sure. that because I haven't had the funds to send it. But she did tell me that when she, they did his most recent x-rays. I mean, does, does, he, does he have a heart murmur or anything mm -hmm. like that that she's, so, nope. okay, great. Um, yeah, um, I mean, Justin, if, if it was, is there, I mean, how can I make him comfortable? Do I do anything when it's happening? Because it's very panicky. I, I've sure. even been in that field and I still don't feel, it's my, this is my first senior dog, so I don't know, I don't know if he's comfortable in the sense or. Yeah, I, I guess it's impossible for me to know exactly what he's experiencing. Um, most dogs or most causes of vestibular problems aren't painful per se. So I don't think he would necessarily be painful. Sure, if it's a tumor affecting bone, not that we think that, but that is an example of something that could cause pain. But if he's not showing symptoms of pain, crying, not wanting to open his mouth, being head shy, I, I don't want you to lose sleep that he's painful. Um, again, your veterinarian who's taken a look at him would have a better ability to, to uh, determine that. Um, I guess, is he uncomfortable from a, you know, being off balance, uh, you know, being nauseous, things like that? Sure, sometimes dogs can be, be dizzy from that. If he's getting better relatively quickly in 20 minutes or so, if he's not vomiting, if he's still eating during the episodes, uh, I, I guess it's hard to make a recommendation for some sort of medication to help with nausea if, if he's improved 20 minutes later. Um, is there any type of medication or treatment? It really depends on the underlying cause. So the treatment for a brain tumor would be different than the treatment for an ear infection. Um, if it were something like a stroke, we would be looking for the underlying cause of the stroke. Is it because of heart disease? Is it because of thyroid disease? Is it because of high blood pressure? Is it because of cancer elsewhere in his body. So um, if we diagnose a stroke, we usually go looking for underlying reasons for stroke. So the treatment really depends on what the underlying cause is. What can I do when they're having to make him as comfortable as possible? It sounds like a lot of the things that you're doing to comfort him and just be there, talk with him are, are the rational things. Again, since he gets better so quickly, you know, I don't think there's a, a necessarily a medication or a treatment you should be doing. Avoid hazards, you know, pools, stairs, lofts, things like that, anything where he can slip and hurt himself. Um, so you have a question here, what is the average time they last? I would base that more off of what he's showing you. If, if he does it and they last, you know, 10 to 20 minutes, that's what it's going to be. So um, I wouldn't necessarily, I wouldn't be able to predict based off of all dogs, how long his are going to last. I would more look at it in the four that he's had, how long are they typically? Um, no, I mean, yeah, you pretty much answered a lot. I, I, I know it would come back down to, to going in for the MRI. I mean, I'll, at this time I can't. Um, it, I luckily have insurance. So once I get payment from what we just had, um, hopefully I can, I can take him in. 
Yeah, so the, the first place that, that I would start would be with an examination. So a, a consultation, um, that's just going to give us a whole lot more information. So, you know, even if you're, you or people in general are unable to proceed with an MRI or proceed with any of these tests that we're talking about right now, there's still a lot of value of going in and having a neurologist or someone that all they do is deal with things like vestibular disease, seizures, paralysis, neck pain, et cetera, just t take a look. Um, our, our consultation fee is $150. So, nice. so for a dog to get an MRI, um, here for a big dog that already has blood work and x-rays will usually end up in the 3000 to mid to high $3,000 ballpark. I, I think that's one of the most common questions you know, that people have is, well, what does an MRI cost? And to me, there are lots of things to consider when you're trying to, to, to get the answer to that question. Um, the, the first thing is who's doing the MRI um, and what's their experience with, with reading the MRI or interpreting it? Is it a place that's going to do an MRI that they're not gonna be the ones that actually use the information and they have to send it out um, versus someone that has experience interpreting the MRI and at the time of the MRI saying, well, gosh, I see something here. Let's look a little bit closer. So just the amount of information you can get at the time of the MRI um, really dictates the amount of information in the interpretation of it. Um, the, the second factor in what an MRI costs is just what kind of MRI is it? So in general, there are two types of MRIs, what are called low field MRI and high field MRI. And uh, nowadays it's not as big of an issue, but um, years past in the state of Florida, there were kind of you know low field MRIs and high field MRIs. And just how I described it to, to the pet owner previously was it's kind of like watching HD TV versus you know adjusting the, the antenna, the, the bunny ears outside on, on your you know, UHF, VHF TV. So just, <coughs> excuse me, the amount of information that you can see, the, the resolution, the clarity of a high field MRI is just that much better than a low field MRI and you can just get a lot more information. The next thing that we often run into is when you call a place and say, how much is an MRI, um, is, is what is actually being quoted. So. When, when we quote our MRI here, we kind of give you, we, we, we prefer to shock you with the high numbers so that you're, you're prepared and there aren't any surprises after the fact and you're hopefully pleasantly surprised that we came in well under that number. Whereas some places will quote it of, here's just what the MRI fee is. Um, and it's just important when you're calling around to, I guess, get that apples to apples what all am I getting? Am I getting my consultation, IV catheter, anesthesia, MRI, interpretation, is a spinal tap included in that, the hospitalization, the contrast, et cetera, or is it just the MRI number? For Apollo, um, being that you just did blood work um, and you just did radiographs, the consultation, IV catheter, anesthesia, MRI, um, contrast, hospital stay, you'd probably end up in the $3,000 ballpark. If we had to do something like a spinal tap or blood pressure or thyroid, you know, that'd probably add another 600 to $800. Uh, you know, you could spend as much as $4,000. Yeah, no, that's, it's, uh, that you've helped out. That's, you've put my mind at ease a little bit more. Well, at least, yeah. at least, yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you. You got it. No, that, that's music to my ears that uh, I've put your mind at ease and, you know, that, uh, that, that, that this was useful. Um, you know, obviously what I would be doing for him right now, you're doing all the important stuff. He's been to the vet, you know, you're keeping a close eye on him. You've done the preliminary tests, the blood work, the x-rays. Um, so I think that's the most important thing for you to be doing right now. If things happen again, you know, that to me would be the time to, to consider taking that next step forward with regards to trying to figure it out. Um, even if it's just the consultation. Thank you so much, Dr. Wong. You got it. Very nice Thank meeting you. both of you. I, I can Thank tell you. that he's very, very stressed out by this whole thing. And uh, Oh, yeah. You want it? Get up? Now come up? Come on. Come on. There you go.
Can you say hi? Good job. Can I have a kiss? That's awesome. We got lucky with him. Yeah. Thank you. Looks like he got lucky too with you. So. This is All righty. My, my right hand man. All right, buddy. All right, sir. Thank you very much. Very nice meeting both of you. You too. Hope, we'll, we'll keep in touch and I'll be contacting you guys soon. You got it. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Hi. Hello. How are you? Hi. Can you hear me? All Thank right. You. We got Kitty there. So, yeah. Yeah. So, um, I, I guess if you can just tell us uh, your name, where, where, where you're, where you're. Where you're from, and a little bit about um, um, your your kitty. What 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 what's what's her name? I don't see. Uh, my name my name is Alexandra. Okay. And my kitty's name is Sol. Okay. Um, we're from Lima, Peru, and um, a friend of mine. Uh, Found, found, found her in in the street and she was like uh, bleeding and everything and they they took some turkeys x-rays x-rays and she had like no fractures, fractures and anything okay. so the doctors thought that it was more like a neuro neurologic Neurology. problem because she just like can't use her back uh, legs. Like she she used the front front legs, no front legs. front legs, front legs, but not her back legs. Back <laughs> legs. And she always she cannot stand. She I'll cannot talk. stand. Like I'll I'll show you. Like she put. Uh, she puts a, a pose like that. I know how to stand. You Not like this, but like, like oh. she cannot stand by herself. Right. So I, I, I got the videos that you sent. Um, so they're they're very, very useful. So I, I can see exactly what you're talking about, where she pulls herself with her front legs, but the back yeah. legs just drag behind her, either kind of forward or they'll go <laughs> back behind. Yeah, and she's always like they, on, on the side. Yeah. And, and she goes like that with her legs on, on one side. And like, we don't know how to, what we don't to know do. what to do. <laughs> how how, how long have you had her? February, yeah. about three months and a half. Yeah. And we did uh, a few sessions of physiotherapy, of physiotherapy. But then after we we enter in quarantine, so we couldn't do uh, anything. We try some exercise at home, but we don't know if they're the right exercises. And she doesn't, uh, well, now with quarantine, we cannot uh, have her to pass uh, uh, resonant. Uh, Emery. Uh, Emery. Emery. Because Every, it's closed everything and, is closed. And... So we don't have like a diagnostic. We, we so, know that she doesn't have fractures, but we don't know. And, and in the time that you've had her, I, 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 I can see the video where she's playing with the other cat. She's moving herself around. She's going down the stairs in that one. You, do you get the feeling that she's painful at all? No, no. no. She's okay. very happy. She's, she's happy. always like, she wants a lot of- Fiction at? Affection. Yeah. yeah. She, she seems happy. She, she seems, seems like a happy very, cat. Uh -huh. She seems like a happy cat. She doesn't seem to have pain at all. But. And 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 you you had said that your vet says that she does not have feeling in her back legs. So if they pinch really hard on on the toes, she does not react. She does not look. No. At yes. Toes. Yes. She does. When she does. They, yeah. they put like electricity mm -hmm. in her in her back legs, and like she she moves. Like when we do or when we do that. Okay, but now she's. You know, like, like she moves sometimes, she, like she starts she feels, to move. Sometimes she, she feels her legs, but she doesn't know how to use them. Sure. And sometimes she starts to move her back legs like that. And right. like that, and uh, doing like this. Or when we bath her because she doesn't know how to use her sin. So we have to, to bath her every day. And when she feels the water, like she, she starts, to, starts move. to move her mm -hmm. back legs a lot. But yeah. 
she doesn't know how to work uh, how to work so well i, I guess f first of all she's super cute and um the, the <laughs> videos that you sent are are awesome they're they're just a uh, just just great evidence of how animals adapt and how happy they can be even if they're you know paralyzed yeah. um so thank you for taking her on and obviously she seems very very happy and you know you guys are very lucky to have each other when i watch her videos um obviously she she's not able to walk in her back legs i do see that there's movement in the legs yes but from here it looks very rhythmic and robotic um where yes. kind of one goes and and it's not it's not that she's purposefully moving them but more so um a a reflex so just like you know when, when you go to the doctor and you sit on the uh, and they tap your knee there's that reflex yeah. and you don't have to think about it it just happens automatically uh -huh. my sus my suspicion is that those are all reflexive movements in her yes. legs and the, the the tail when it goes like that is all yeah. reflexive movements as well yes. so i i don't want to you know from from, from, from across the world through the internet, make a diagnosis and say, I don't yeah, think that she's purposefully moving them. Um, my impression from seeing other cats that do that where their legs move rhythmically and the, the tail just kind of vibrates, um, my suspicion is that she cannot consciously feel her back legs. Mm -hmm. So when I say, as a neurologist, when I say feel the back legs, I mean, when you pinch on the back legs that she recognizes it and looks at it or cries yeah. or tries to bite you as yeah. opposed to as opposed to when you touch it that she pulls it back real fast. That mm -hmm. pulling back is also a reflex, just like yes. so j just like if you were to touch a you know, a, a, a hot stove without thinking about it, you're, you're, you'd pull your hand back immediately. Mm -hmm. That is what I'm interpreting what she's doing yes. as a reflex, as opposed to a purposeful, her brain is telling her back legs to move. While it's impossible for me to say without examining her in person, my impression of her is that she's unable to voluntarily move her legs. And my mm -hmm. bet is that she also cannot consciously feel her back legs so mm -hmm. and, and and that's from not using the limbs um mm -hmm. it can also be because of the whatever the injury was so that that's one of the big questions is is what is the injury was it you know along with the 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 blood that you found on her when when you found her was it an external injury you know did a dog mm -hmm. bite her did she get hit by a car even if we yeah, can't well, well they told us that that they found us they found her um in the back of a car uh with a lot of blood in, in her thing but we don't know if she was born like that or if it was an accident or like we just we, we don't know exactly we we don't know so in general, the things that can cause a spinal cord problem in a young cat, one would be some sort of, we call congenital abnormality. Um, so a birth defect that she was born that way and she's always been that way. Um, the next would be some sort of external trauma, whether she fell off something, whether a car hit her, she got caught in a door, a dog bit her, you know, a person hurt her, et cetera. Um, the next thing would be some sort of infection. So cats can get infections of their spinal cord and or the surrounding structures. If that were the case, I would suspect that she would be getting worse over the three months or that she but, would be painful. Yeah, but, she's no, but she's been a bit better. Like she has uh, more strength in, just, in, in, in her legs. Like she moves, she moves, she moves them. Uh, a lot a lot more than when we just okay. had her um she has a lot of strengths like she, with, has, more strength. she has more strength in her leg that that could be a couple before. things um one it could be like you said that she's just getting better um and i i i don't want to again you know decrease your hope or anything like that 
because I haven't been able to see her. Um, it could be that she's getting better. The, the second thing would be just, you know, I, I assume you're feeding her a much better diet than she was probably getting in the streets. So maybe yeah. some of the strength that you're seeing improvement is just because you're feeding her better and she's, um, you know, she, she's just better cared for than when she was in the streets. Mm -hmm. She's seeing a veterinarian, she's dewormed, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But the, the last thing would be these reflexive movements, kind of the longer we get out from an injury, sometimes the more dramatic those movements are. Um, mm -hmm. So just with time, those jerking movements, that, uh, that reflexive movement can actually become more dramatic. You know, the, the questions that I see that you have here of, you know, what can we do to, to help her walk? If she truly cannot feel her back legs, if, if, if she truly cannot feel her back legs, the likelihood of her ever normally walking, voluntarily walking is probably very low. Yeah. Th that said, you know, young cat, two month old cat, three month old cat, you know, now six month old cat. If there's anyone that, that I, I don't know if, if they have the saying in, in, in Peru of, you know, cats having nine lives. If there's anyone that's going to get better, it's, it's a kitten. Um, yes. Cats can, that, that reflexive movement can get dramatic enough that sometimes it may even look that it's a coordinated movement that she might get up and take some steps on, on her own. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's what some neurologists, some veterinarians would call spinal walking. So that yeah. is something that um, can be developed and she might start doing that makes it look like she's walking in her rear limbs, but it's mm -hmm. reflexive activity, it's not purposeful, but if it helps her get around, mm -hmm. fantastic. Um, the likelihood is you're always going to have to help her pee, um, that she's not going to use the litter box on her own and you're going to need to place her in the litter box and um, yeah. gently put pressure on her, on her belly to help her pee on her yeah. own. Many times dogs and cats that have that reflexive activity and, and the, the movements of the tail, they're already hyper excitable or just barely touching the belly will cause them to pee on their own. So that might actually yeah. be a good thing for her. Um, oh, when we back her, she automatically start to uh, do her knees. Do her knees, knees and to pee and everything like that. Yeah. One of the things to yeah. do would be to, to, to start feeling her belly and just get a, a sense for what her bladder feels like. Um, if it's something that every time you put her in the bath, the bladder goes from being big to being small, um, then that's mm -hmm. fine. But many times animals that aren't able to pee on their own, their bladder goes from being really big to being still still big. So you might have to mm -hmm. express her bladder to help her pee. Um, there are lots of resources online uh, that teach you how to express a bladder. Um, we actually just posted a, a, a video on it yesterday or two days ago. So yeah. um, it, it should be out there. Um, yeah. With regards to, to exercises, I saw many of the exercises that you're doing. It looks like you have a balanced disc and you're, you know, putting her legs through bicycling movements, yeah. and toe pinches. So where, where you're pinching and having her pull back, I, I can see where you're having her stand on the, mm -hmm. the appropriate part of her legs. Those are all good things to be doing. Now they may not necessarily get her to being walking on her own, but mm -hmm. there's still good things for, for you to be doing um, so that so that her legs don't get stuck straight, you know, just mm -hmm. those bicycling movements um, so that the joints don't get locked a a and potentially developing those spinal <coughs> reflexes, excuse me, those spinal mm -hmm. movements to help her potentially spinal walk. Um, that, that, that's all reasonable for you to keep doing what you're doing. I just want you to know that the likelihood of her walking normally, again, from what I've seen on the video and from what you've told me, I, I suspect the likelihood of her walking on her own voluntarily is very, very low. Again, I don't want to take away your hope, um, but I, I do mm -hmm. want to realistically prepare you for what she might be in for. Yes. But you've had her mm -hmm. for four months. As you can see, she's happy as can be right now. She's just 
sitting <laughs> in the I can't hear her, but I, I can tell that she's, you know, she's probably- But look at her, at her back leg, like she. <laughs> but, but, but again, from, from the waist up, She's a very normal, happy, affectionate cat. Yeah. Loves yeah, being she's here. very affectionate. Uh, what, what could we do? Because she always, when she, we try to stand up, she, she always has like uh, the part of a paw like this. What can we do? Can we do oh, something uh, special to stimulate that? Because sometimes I go, I go like that, but I don't know if it helps. Because or... instead of like putting her, her like, straight, straight like, she like puts, that, like she, she, it she put it. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. okay. What can yeah, we so, do for, for that? So the same exercises you're doing are, are reasonable to be doing, but kind of when there's a spinal cord injury, one of the first things to go away is knowledge of where the foot is. So we'll, we'll often see dogs and cats start scuffing their foot and then as the injury gets worse, they're dragging. And then yeah. as the injury gets worse, they're not able to move. And then as the injury gets worse, they're unable to feel the legs. So when pets recover from spinal cord injury, it happens in the opposite order. Meaning one of the last things to ever get better in a spinal cord injury is knowing where that foot is. So in, in her case, it's really, really, really unlikely that she's one, going to walk, but two, get her foot in the right spot. Mm -hmm. The things you can be doing, again, the bicycling movements, the toe pinching, the, um, the balance disc, are all things you can and should be doing um, to, to give her as good of a quality of life as possible. My job is more to help you know what the, the, the likely outcome is and what the reasonable expectations are. So I, I don't think it's reasonable for you to expect that her feet are ever going to walk normally 100% of the yeah. time. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's going to happen based off of what you're telling me and of what I'm seeing. But do but, you think she can like uh, get better? Or if, if we go to Miami? Well, because we're thinking, usually we go up to Miami and we were thinking about going like in April, but we got with all that situation. So as soon as when uh, I mean the the borders open, we're thinking about going to Miami and have a, 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 a session at least that you can see her and. Uh, I, I certainly think there's value in her being evaluated by a neurologist. Mm -hmm. So seeing her in yeah. person will kind of take me from making assumptions based off of the mm -hmm. videos to to knowing personally I've pinched her toes and I know she can't feel them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I think there's value in being evaluated. Um, at, at the same time, I, I don't want to give false hope that, you know, oh, yeah, no, no, we understand. Tra we understand traveling is going to, you know, let me wave a magic wand and she's going to, you know, be, be able to walk again. Now, do I think she can have a great quality of life? Yes. I mean, I think she's having a great great quality of oh, life yes. right now. Oh, yeah. She's oh, yes, very she does. happy. She's always happy. She's I, I, I realize your goal is yeah. to make sure that her quality of life is as good as it can be. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think my ability to best answer, is there anything else we can be doing? Sure, is by seeing in person. Um, mm -hmm. Again, my, my suspicion based off of what I'm seeing is, is that she's severely affected and, um, you know, there might not be a lot that we can do, but I, I don't think it hurts anything to, to be evaluated, you know, yeah, especially yeah. if you're already planning on, on visiting Miami. Yes. Um, yeah. Okay. yeah. Also, yeah. Uh, one thing like what really bothers us, well, because she's a happy cat and she walks, she doesn't walk, but the, the question the, of uh, hygiene, that's really the tough part for us. And we put her diapers. Because without diapers, she, I don't know if, she, if it's the good thing that she always wears diapers or maybe just like uh, a f only a few hours a day. Yeah, so I, I think the most important thing for you to, to try and get good at is expressing her bladder. So any animal that mm -hmm. is um, on that scale of one to five, that's a four or a five, and it sounds like she's a five they're unable to voluntarily pee or urinate on their own. So their bladder fills with, 
with urine and it just gets gets big but um it it only squishes out a little bit at a time as opposed to fully yeah. emptying and that's why you're having a you know you're, you're having pee accidents that's why you're keeping the diaper on her um my bet is if you were to express her bladder and get it from you know this big to that big um mm -hmm. it, it would empty it and that way she wouldn't have accidents so mm -hmm. expressing her bladder three or four times a day will let you say okay now's the time to pee here's an appropriate time you know it'll keep her clean it will keep um the urine off of her it'll make it that you have to bathe her less frequently and it will also make it less likely that she develops a urinary tract infection so when you're unable to fully empty your bladder you're more likely to develop or get bacteria and that lead to infection which can lead to things like just being painful can lead to other infections in the body yeah like she has she got an infection about two months ago. She done an infection because oh, I, I think because she was moving. On, she didn't wear diapers. We left her on the grass, and I think maybe she got uh, from that uh, rubbing her skin on the ground. It's probably she a combination of things. <laughs> Um, one, just her constantly, you know, not being able to walk on her feet and she's dragging on herself. Yeah. Yeah. Just the physical trauma is one thing. Mm -hmm. um, the next thing is probably just she had what we call urine scald. When there's urine on the skin, mm -hmm. it can irritate the skin and make it, make it easier to yeah. damage. So the, the things for, for you to be doing, one, expressing her bladder so that she's not getting urine on herself. Mm -hmm. Two, if she gets urine on herself, um, that that you clean it and get her dry. And it sounds like you guys are doing that all the all the time. Yeah. You're cleaning her, bathing her. Um, diapers are okay for accidents, but we shouldn't keep the diaper on her. If it gets urine in it, that's just keeping the urine up against her body, and and, and that way she can get infection. infections. Yeah. It's just keeping it moist. It's keeping her, her skin. Um, it's just going to lead to to more damage. Um, th there are things that can help her one get around and two protect herself when she drags around. Many dogs will go into wheelchairs. I haven't seen many cats in wheelchairs. I think because she's so young, you know, she she might adjust to a wheelchair a lot more than say a 10 year old cat would would take yeah, to yeah. it so a, a wheelchair um is, is a, a consideration like it i'm sorry like it could be a, an option, an option. if we try yes. the same thing and she does um, so. yes mm -hmm. i think that would be an option um and, and then another thing that they have i've seen it more for dogs is they call it a, a drag bag where basically it instead of it just being a diaper that their legs go through, it kind of encircles their legs and kind of from the waist down. And that lets them drag on the surface of the bag as opposed to on their skin. The downsides of that are kind of like wearing a diaper. It's keeping, you know, has the potential to keep poop and pee and moisture in there. So you would need to keep her very, very clean. Okay. Uh, so I would like to know how long after she eats, a drink, uh, should we press uh, like the, the belly, maybe half an hour? Or? Yeah, it, it's not so much that I would do it right after feeding or, or drinking. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would just kind of get on a regular schedule. Regular. You know, when you get up in the morning, mm -hmm. lunchtime, afternoon, mm -hmm. bedtime, you know, maybe four times a day, uh, maybe five okay. times a day un until you get better at it. And then you can go down to three or four times a day. So um yes. so i i would more have a schedule yes okay, okay. she's like a little mermaid, mermaid. <laughs> a little what <laughs> mermaid when she puts uh, she, 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 okay 
Well, she's super cute. She's very mm -hmm. lucky to have found a, a home like yours. Um, because quite frankly, you know, she she wouldn't be around right now if it wasn't for you taking her in. Yeah. Um, sure. I, sure. I've had a paralyzed pet and know how much work it is, but how rewarding it can be. Um, so ha hats off to you guys for taking her on. Um, Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much Thank you for, for, your your, for your advice. And um, okay. as soon as we can, we, <laughs> we see you in Miami. As soon as the... Mm -hmm. I, I think if there's one thing for you to be, oh, sorry, if there's one thing for you to be doing for her right now, it's learning how to express her bladder and then yes. just continuing with all of the other stuff you're doing, bathing her, keeping her dry, keeping her clean, mm -hmm. and then the exercises that you're like, doing. For example, right now, she's like, clean, she was cleaning herself like this. It's like the second time uh, I saw her doing that. Because normally she, she just... Um, clean, uh, clean her front legs. Front legs and here. But now I don't know why <laughs> she's cleaning her back, back legs. Yeah, just a little bit. <laughs> now, keep, keep an eye on that. If it's if it's cleaning like 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 a normal cat, that's fine. If she starts kind of chewing at her toes, that worries me a little bit more. But if it's just kind of doing what she's doing now, where it looks like she's grooming herself, nothing to worry about. Okay. Okay. Alrighty. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you, you so very much. much. Thank you so much. You and, uh, maybe we we'll see you. Hopefully, we we'll see you soon in uh, Miami, so you can yeah. have, uh, can give her an evaluation. Oh, more. Thanks for taking care of her. Uh, nice meeting the three of you. Thank yeah, you. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.